What's up, everybody? Got a great show for you tonight. Don't go anywhere. We got the great Dave Fuge with us in the house. You're dialed into, into the, the show, show that informs, entertains, entertains inspires, inspires, and promotes, promotes all things, things that go left. left. Welcome, Welcome to, to Late, Late Model, Model Monday, Monday, a weekly show to stay in the know about asphalt, asphalt Late, Late Models here in the Pacific, Pacific Northwest. Northwest. Tonight's, Tonight's show, show is brought to you by Miller, Miller Kitchen and Bath, Bath Bailey, Bailey General, General Contractors, Contractors, and by Myers Floor Covers, Walter's Gun Shop, Flaming Pig Barbecue, and by the Wenatchee Valley Super Old and the Leonard Evans Used Car Superstore, and by the great folks at Product41.com, McKinney Glass of Yakima, Atomic Screen printing and blg blue line graphics be unique stand out and get noticed www.blg.blue and now back to your horsepower and performance host terry bridges and the low jeff e oh what is going on racers i gotta tell you we got a super great show for you tonight i want to let you know this man needs no introduction uh, I mean, he's basically done it all. I'll say his name. You'll know who it is. It's the legendary Mr. Dave Fuge. What's going on, Dave? How are you, man? Yeah, I'm pretty good. I don't know how legendary I am, but uh, thanks for having me on. It's great to be there and uh, connect with all your guests from the great Northwest, man. Dude, I'm telling you, what do you mean not legendary, man? I mean, you bring you bring Brian Bowman, Matt Alexander, Jeff Clint. You know Jeff Clements, don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we got George Dodsworth in the house. Welcome to the show, everybody. We're going to have a cool one tonight. One hour. Um, we have Mr. Dave Fuge. We're going to be talking a little bit about um, some of his history. We're going to be talking about his likes, dislikes. I mean, it's just going to be cool to kind of go back in time and, and kind of relive some cool stuff. So, Dave, what... How did this all start for you? I mean, when when did you actually start stock car racing? Well, I would say it probably probably started in probably about 1969. I was 14 years old and then kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I wasn't very athletic and probably still not very athletic. Um, <laughs> everybody kind of knew that already. So I just kind of looking for my thing and just so happens when I come from the small town of Sumner, Washington and um, I just fell in love with cars and, uh, my mom and dad, uh, my mother was a, uh, was a, uh, a waitress and a bartender in, in Casey's caboose in Sumner. And, uh, there was a lot of the racers would go in there and I got to know some of them. And the first one I ever met was Jim Johnson. And, uh, we used to go to Spanaway Speedway and see Jim Johnson race. And that's kind of how that started the bug. It seemed like that was my thing then. So, so Jim Johnson was like your kind of your like first hero, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Wow, he's a great, great guy to be around. He was a lot of fun. Pretty crazy. So, but, uh, before you got all hooked up in the big stuff, so you had Jim Johnson. Who were some of your other heroes that you used to go and watch when you were like a young teenager? Well, I mean, when I first, I guess the first race car I really worked on, I was fifteen, and uh, uh, Rick Brock had a a radiator shop there in uh, Sumner and uh, he was a uh, uh, he would partake in the bartending part of my mom's career <laughs> uh, he, he had a race car that he just so happened that he was building right there in his radiator shop and I he couldn't keep me away as a kid and uh, I guess that's kind of where it started I can I still remember going in there the first day and I started working sweeping his floors so I was kind of the grunt and answering the phone and doing all that stuff and he let me work on a race car, and I was so excited. I'll never, ever forget the first thing I ever did was cut a piece of three-and-a-half-inch exhaust pipe with a hacksaw, and uh, with no experience, you can imagine what that looked like. So that was, the day, <laughs> that was the day all the razzing began and bugging the kid that worked in the shop that turned out to be the guy that you know, harasses everybody to this day. So that's kind of where it all started right there. So I raced with uh, Rick Brock, and then – uh, later, Kent Brock at Spanaway. I got to know all the all the people at Spanaway. I mean, it goes back to you know all the Benjamins and Clem Goddard and you know all the guys the late uh, uh, Don Lorenz and uh, Ken Longley and I mean you name all the greats from back in that day. And I mean, they were all heroes to me. And it's amazing that I still run into people's relatives that were from that day. So that's kind of where I got started. And uh, 
just so happened I met Ron Eaton out there in uh, at Spanaway, and I somehow I, I still don't even know how I did it. I still conned him into letting me come work on his race car. So uh, that really started my career in 1975. I was working with Ron. I never had another job again that wasn't in racing. Wow, man, that's that's incredible. So you never did you never did wheel? Did you drive ever? No, nah, I was never. I never wanted to drive. I'm kind of one of those guys. I was so so into racing so deep that I knew if I ever drive or tried to drive, I'd probably be broke trying to win. So uh, I just kind of stuck to the mechanical side and that was my challenge for me. And, and just, you know, trying to make the better race car. Wow. So now when you, so in 75, you started working for Eaton and uh, were you still cutting exhaust tube with a hacksaw? <laughs> no, I got a little better than that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I learned, I, I learned from my mistakes quite well. Wow. And so, when you were there, what were you doing for Eaton? Were you doing Were you doing everything, or? Well, pretty much. I mean, I started out at the bottom, just like everybody else does, and uh, I, you know, I kind of outlasted everybody and ended up as a crew chief. It was just a matter of time. But uh, you know, I learned more from Ron, you know, about his work ethic and his desire to win races, and you know, everything in my career. I mean, I, I just think I grew up in the perfect time in racing. Um, it was the time that we transitioned from cars that were actually built out of the wrecking yard um, to, you know, days when we went all the way up to coilovers and, and fiberglass bodies. And I mean, you name it, all the wild stuff, all the, all the crazy stuff. But, you know, I learned everything from there along the way. I mean, as I worked up, I started working on engines and, and uh, you know, next thing you know, I'm building his engines and, and uh, uh, crew chief in a car. And, and, you know, that's when I got to know the great, Don and Jerry Cope, Cope Brothers Racing Engines. Um, that led me to meeting Derek. I mean, everything, I, I, I don't know really anything that I did in my career that didn't really start with Ron Eaton. I mean, it's just, he just, he taught me so much. He actually taught me, he taught me how drivers think. And Ron was a great, great thinking race car driver. I think if everybody ever raced against him, I think you know, um, but he he taught me an awful lot about that kind of stuff, and and I, I don't think he I probably owe him more more uh, for my success, I guess, than anybody. I mean, he doesn't know that I'm sure, but that's uh, it, it. Really, it all started from him, and he just let me blossom. That's the big thing. Wow, man! So you know, and so let's talk about that for a second. I mean, um, you said Eaton's work ethic and his desire to win. What what do you? What do you mean by that? Can you can you kind of elaborate on that? Well, I mean, Ron Ron just looks at things. He still does to this day. I mean, I, I had a chance to go back and meet with them this summer and, and see him for I hadn't seen him for years, but to this day, he's always he doesn't really glorify a lot of stuff. I mean, he just he just does things matter of fact. You know, he doesn't let emotions make his judgment. I mean, he's just he was just that kind of guy. He was just you don't let things get in your way you know you just think what you want to do and you go out and do it and uh with ron there was you know you can't ron's pretty independent and uh i was kind of you know i was independent and he just kind of i just kind of fell into it with him with that mm -hmm. so i mean I guess everybody you know if you want to do it get out and do it you know i mean nobody says you can't i mean i guess it's i don't know if it's combination of being real smart that i've been here or else i'm dumb enough not to know i shouldn't be doing it <laughs> yeah well, you know, when we talked to this afternoon, you said um, JJ Safino had a had a, had a big influence uh, in your career too. Can you tell us about that? Oh yeah, I mean uh, that whole thing started. I mean it was the same deal with Ron, you know, and me coming up through the five years that I was there with him was was the race car building. I mean JJ built race cars for Ron as he did a lot of people, and uh, you know Ron. It, it was always funny because. JJ was great, but Ron always knew what he wanted, and so they'd always get into arguments about how things should be done. But um, JJ did an excellent job, and I was there. I was really Ron's first full-time employee, and uh, and so I basically did everything. So I ended up kind of, I kind of running his shop, and I was I was there helping JJ build cars, and and he taught me, you know, he taught me everything about building cars. I mean, it's just this whole fabrication and you know uh, the way he did things. I mean, he helped me. He taught me how to weld. He told me we were, we were, uh, he basically encouraged me because he was there for a year or two, built cars, I think, and didn't work full time for us, but built cars for us. And it was, 
I think that I'm not sure exactly how it came down, but it was finally one time that we wanted to get a car built and JJ really didn't have time to do it. And he told me to go out and do it. And I said, well, JJ, I can't even weld. And he said, yeah, you can. It ain't that hard. So he kind of picked up the lever and showed me how to do it. And, and he kind of, went, a little while later, we walked away. And I said, I thought you were going to teach me how to weld. And he said, well, I don't need to teach you. You already figured it out. So um, that was just kind of how we did it. Wow. That's how, we, how we did it. See, I love hearing that stuff because when I, when I was racing, um, of course, I was never that big. I mean, I was never on the pavement. But when I was racing on the dirt at Willamette, um, he had married Barb Goulet. And so, um, JJ helped me, uh, I mean, he helped me build my first car. And so uh, it was kind of the same thing. I, I totally get what you mean, but you know, what was cool was he was the master of wrecking yard stuff, man. He, he oh, could yeah. tell you, man, you have to use a, 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 you know, a 68 Chevelle front end with the, with the 65 Cadillac spindles. And you take this, you know, take this little, uh, bushing out and it frees everything up take the o-rings out of your gm caliper so they flow i mean he was just um he was just a, a wizard at that stuff well aj i mean uh, jj was uh he was definitely a wizard at that he definitely knew how to race i mean back in the day that's what i think that these younger kids miss you know the things that we did because we actually went to the record yard and you knew what uh you knew what parts to get just like you said off of every different type of car i can remember back from the the rick brock days and we had a floating rear end that was that was built by a company in tacoma and i can't remember their name now but almost nobody had floating hubs and the only axles you could buy come from a 59 mercury park lane station wagon and i i, I don't i don't remember a lot of things but there are certain things that stick out and for some reason i'll always remember that that those axles were very rare and hard to find, but that's what we did. And I, I think, I know when we were Ron, everybody was always looking for a, a, a smaller spring to put in the left rear. And one of our secrets is we had, we found a rear spring from an Opal in a wrecking yard. And that's what we ended up running in the left rear. And we kicked everybody's butt with Ron because we could get a spring soft enough to run in the left rear the way we wanted to race. So it was just all that stuff. You, you went to the wrecking yard and you knew what parts to get. You know, you didn't go to that buy rated springs. You went to the wrecking yard and got springs, and you just knew what kind of car. And you, you had to know what, what the equipment the car came with because, uh, you know, the cars that had more equipment had heavier springs. And, uh, you know, the Cadillacs were basically, you know, Chevrolets glorified, and they were bigger and faster and stronger. And so they always had all the parts were had the same dimensions, but they were tougher. So, uh, you know, I can remember that we went back and had uh, – uh, when we made our wheels at Spanaway, they were like an Oldsmobile shell on the inside and a Buick shell on the outside or vice versa. I mean, it's, it's things like that. We all made things, and that was the difference. I mean, you just it was hands-on. So, like I said, I just don't know how I could have come from a better time, actually, in racing. Yeah, I, I agree, Dave. I mean, because I, I can remember one of the things that I remember I'll never forget from, from Jay was he one day he, he, got, he got so – he kind of got – ticked at me because we were we were in that era of right when everything was kind of going away from that and it was more you could buy you know you could buy rated springs the shocks or you know none of that crap was the the old school stuff but he picks up the front of the car and he bounces it up and down you know and and he tells me he says there are no secrets here people know this stuff there's guys that are good there's guys better than me there's just a, he says you want to know where the real secret is and he walks around to the car and he pats the seat and he goes there's where the secret is and uh i i will never i will never forget that as long as i live well and that's there you go it goes back to the just what we said about what ron eaton's done for me i mean that guy had such excellent feel i mean any little thing that we did he could feel and he could relate to you and what it was doing and where on the racetrack it was doing. I mean, the good drivers like that were, were the onboard computers, you know, that they have today. I mean, they just, they knew, and you can, you get a driver that knows what he wants and, and knows the feel he's looking for. I mean, they direct you out. They make life easier for you. I mean, it's just, there's no doubt. I mean, I, you know, we won a championship in the truck series with Mike Bliss. You know, and then I ran with Travis, did the same thing with Travis Quapel. And it's the same thing. Those guys were drivers that were capable of telling you what they needed to go faster. And, you know, there's no magic in this stuff. It's it's like the drivers that can tell you, 
they make it easy and you feel stupid because they're the ones actually telling you what they need. You're just using your mechanical ability to to give them what they want. But when you get with a driver that really has no feel and doesn't know what he wants, I, I don't care who you are. You know, I, you could be the most, you could be Chad Knauss or any of the bigger crew chiefs. You're not going to get anything out of them guys. I mean, you just, if a guy doesn't know, you know, so the driver, the driver's everything. I mean, it, the driver is definitely everything. I mean, if you, you talk about the guys that have come along in the last few years that, that, that like Kyle Bush, you know, and there's a lot of people don't like him because he's so focused and he's just a jerk and all he wants to do is race. And that's all he thinks about, but that's what it takes to be successful. That guy knows exactly what he wants. Um, you, all the guys are successful. Mm -hmm. I like that. All, all the drivers, you know? Well, yeah. Like, like, like I, I'm, I'm sure like uh, both, I don't know. Uh, Hornaday was another one that was like that. I'm sure. Oh, and, yeah, and, and definitely, definitely. And, and Jack Sprague too. I mean, I think both those guys were were guys that that knew what they wanted, and and they were um, they were wheels. I mean, they were. Well, you can go down. You can go down that list. I mean, <laughs> you you can go down the list, and, and every one of the drivers that are great is that way. They all, that's the difference between the great drivers and the ones that are just average drivers is they know exactly what they want, and they keep trying for more. I had Jack Sprague drive for me, and that guy is probably one of the most talented drivers I've ever had. He just never – it's never enough for him. You know, and you get guys like it's like him and Kyle Busch, you know, no matter what you give them, they're always complaining, You're, you know, and they always want more. Mike Bliss, same way, always want more. I mean, we could be out running the field, you know, and he would say, oh, this thing's terrible. It's a pig. It won't turn. It's like, well, slow down about, about three or four tenths you know, like everybody else is, and it probably handle really good. <laughs> but th there are no limits to those guys. And that's, those are the guys that are successful. Some of them are better politicians uh, than others. And, uh, I, and I can, I can vouch for that myself because I've never been much of a politician. So I've always, uh, I've usually always had plenty to say and usually not politically correct. <laughs> that's quite all right, man. There's nothing better than a, at least, you know, at least everybody knows where they stand with you. And that's, that's uh that's more important than you know kind of sugarcoating everything. But did you know? My question is: Did you ever work with Herschel? No, I never worked at all for Herschel McGriff. You never did work with him. <laughs> yes, that that was the other thing that you know, when I was with when I was at Spanaway, and coming up around the time that I was getting getting to work with Ron, um, there were some guys that are up there that in the Northwest that were really good. You know, Donnie Hall. I mean, he was a hero of mine. He drove Jerry Craker's car. And, yep. Um, I mean, they were big time to me. And I, you know, and, and there's 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 three or four Northwest guys that I really really like. You know, I I really like Jack Jeffries, and that's somebody I got to know. You know, as I got a little bit older, and there there was just a bunch of great guys. I mean, you can't name them all, but Herschel McGriff, man, he was like, he was my Richard Petty. He was the star, and I did get to work with him. Um, and unfortunately, it's kind of an embarrassing story for me because. Uh, I was working with uh, uh, the wholesale truck team, John and, and uh, Richard Keeper, out of Portland, which I know you know. Yep. And they're an excellent family, and we had a blast. And they, uh, I helped them in the Winston West car, and we went to Australia, and Herschel was driving it. And I didn't have as much – I didn't have any experience on big tracks, and that was that was kind of a super speedway to us. And uh, we went there with the high banks and all that stuff. And I'm doing stuff, on, you know, with, with like you can run on late models and the zero bump steer and things like that. And you can't get away with those things on big tracks. So I, in my – the one embarrassing point I've got is I finally got to work with Herschel and I took him to, to Australia. And uh, it was probably a handful. I, you know, I felt I – I, I think I tried to kill Herschel McGriff. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of always one of my memories right there. I think we finished fifth, but – uh, somewhere in that neighborhood, but it wasn't, uh, I don't know. We were always looking to win. So fifth place wasn't much for me. So, right. It was, that was definitely a big memory. Wow. Now what, a, now, now was, was junior on the, was junior on that squad too, when you, when you were working there or did you get to work with Herschel junior very much? I um, mean, I know him. Um, I don't really know how much we work together. We've been around each other. I mean, we're Facebook friends. I mean, um, we all kind of know each other, but I can't tell you it, it's quite embarrassing, I guess, but, I know so many people would have met so many people along the way. I can't even, I can't remember, you know, a 10th of them probably. And I come, I get people to talk to me all the time that say that we used to race this track or this, this deal together, all that stuff. I can't even hardly remember all the people. It's, just, <laughs> it's literally been thousands and thousands of great people, you know, that I've met 
and you just can't remember them all. Well, that's yeah. what ha- that's what happens, Fuge, when you're a legend. Well, I don't know about that legend. I'm just I just yeah. lasted longer than anybody else, I guess. Ah man, I everybody into making a living, and I got you know I was very fortunate. I was just in the right place at the right time. I mean, I think a lot of it, you know, I made myself because I I refused to. Uh, well, take a take a phrase from Ray Everham. I refused to lose. You know, and nobody was going to tell me I couldn't. My mom told me all the time when I was growing up, the can't never did nothing. So I figured if I was going to be successful, I had to do it. So if it wasn't for the people I've been around, um, I'd have never made it. I mean, my whole career is about people. I mean, I learned everything from Ron, and it got me into so many situations. I I got to have opportunities to work with the keepers and do some Winston West stuff and, and, and with Jim Bound driving and Herschel driving. And, you know, I mean, Derek drove some. And it was just, you know, I worked with Gar- uh, Garrett Evans. I mean, excellent race car driver, excellent person. I mean, if you ever want to talk about a guy that has the itch and it's like a disease, it's Garrett. And he always he always asks questions. He never, ever stops asking questions, and that's the way I was. And, and if it wasn't for Garrett and Chuck Flora and Ron Eaton and guys like that that had the, the, the funds to actually go to some of the bigger venues and actually race, um, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been able to make, it. I mean, I, I went to the Mark Walbridge. I went to, uh, uh, Pensacola with him. I went to, uh, all America 400 with him. Uh, we went to New Smyrna and raced there for, for a winter. I think, I mean, it's just everybody I went, I mean, Chuck Flora, we went to Altus, Oklahoma and raced a big $10,000 to win race, you know? And if it wasn't for those guys taking me all over the place, I would have never got to meet people and I never would have got to see the competition. So I, I owe it all those guys. I mean, I started my race car building business with Chuck Flora. I mean, it started in his garage, his money. He paid me. We, we, we charged people to build race cars for him. And Chuck got the money and he paid me. And I, I'm sure he lost money in the deal. <laughs> you know, I never asked. But uh, um, we just we did it together. Just everything. It just finally evolved. Everything evolves, you know. It yeah. Just, you stay at it long enough, you just evolve. You know. I you know I've just had so many great relationships with so many people. I mean, you, all the foxes. I mean, whether it was whether it was Jim Fox or Tom Fox or Leon Fox or Bobby Fox. You know, friends with all of them. You know. I mean, I, and we passed. You know, we crossed paths for for years. I mean, I race I race against Bobby. I race with Bobby. You know, he's back here, and I've, I've worked with him for uh, time and time again. He's actually worked for me. You know, I, I, Leon was back here before he passed away, and, you know, he, he his shop was right across the street from my shop. I mean, it was just when I first came back here with Derek in 87, Jim Fox was there, and he was running, um, and he was really the only one, and he's, like, wide open. That guy never quit. I mean, his work ethic was unbelievable, you know, and just it, it was – I don't know. I've just been gifted. That's all I can say. You know, the great people that I've been around is just, it's just, that's what's made it so good for me. Well, do you, you know Glenn Seidelman, don't you? I know the name. Yep. Yep. He, he was big. He's more of an open wheel guy, but you know, man, dude. So let's talk about, so you said you started building cars. You know, Dave Goulet and I were, we're like best friends. So we used to talk all the time. When you were building cars, you used to build cars with a little 110 welder, right? Oh, yeah. I had all the best, man. Wow, that's crazy. I mean, because Goulet used to say, yeah, man, Fuge builds it with a 110 welder, and you had it on a little rack that rotated around the car so you could, you know, weld stuff. And and there was all kinds of stories, man. It was – um. oh, yeah, no, it was pretty cool. I mean, we like I said, we had fun. I, we had lots of fun, you know. So let me ask you, so what building cars, I mean, obviously like, like kind of like you said, I mean, JJ used to say all the time, you know, there, there ain't no money in building cars. There's building, there's making money and repairing them, but there ain't no money in, in, in building them. But what did you like best about building cars? Really? I just like to get the racers better race cars. I mean, I, I'm all about, I know I, I run my mouth a lot for anybody that knows me, and I'm, I'm pretty confident. Uh, I did grow up in a shop when I was 15 years old with a bunch of 30-something guys that drank, and they didn't like no young guys around, so I got a lot of heat. So that's kind of where I got – I kind of got my attitude. But, you know, it's just all those people just bring it 
you know, they, they were the one, they're the ones that brought it all on, you know? Yeah. What now? What was Flora? Was Flora a lot like Eaton? Chuck Flora was kind of the sleeper in the bunch, you know. I mean, uh, he he's a another guy that's just a complete workaholic, and uh, I mean, he worked night and day to go race. I mean, he had his own business, but I mean, he wasn't rich by any means, but he had enough to go do what we wanted. And he, his family guy, we always took his family, and. Uh, we all had a great time. We were all family. And that, that's what most of those guys, I was family with all of them. But, you know, he was, uh, he was a sponge. And I mean, I used to give him grief all the time about his driving and, you know, ragging on him and he could take it. So we're still, you know, we're great friends. I mean, I hadn't seen him for years and I got to see him uh, when I came out there last fall and we actually spent some time at their house. Chuck, typical racer Chuck, he's built his grandkids and his great grandkids, a little dirt track out back for, the go-karts he bought he bought go-karts from a, a guy that closed down a go-kart track so when we came out there to visit my grandson was with me he was 13 and he never ridden a go-kart so we went out there and it was just a typical old family racing go-karts out in the backyard so that's awesome it, oh yeah it was, it was cool so i mean it was we just had an awesome time well you know i'll tell you i over the last uh probably two years i mean i used to watch him all the time but we we've got his grandson Jaden is is doing the junior lates down at at Madera and, and Vegas and so I've got to be friends with Walbridge and so sometimes we go back and forth right and yeah. I mean he likes to ride he like you said in that shop right he likes to give me some heat so I need some ammo Fuge I need some ammo no I'm just kidding on, I, 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 on, on Walbridge no I'm just kidding but I mean <laughs> how often did you go I mean. He he was tough back there, was he not? Oh yeah, no, yeah. We he was tough. I Mark Mark was great. I mean, and he was he was right in there with 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 uh, Flora and and Eaton and and Evans. I mean, he wanted to go race the big time, and and he paid me to do it. And by by doing that, we were it just opened up my options. I remember that we went to Pensacola, and I can remember somebody blew an engine, cost us making a race, but somebody blew an engine in practice going into turn three and he hit the oil and he went off the racetrack and they didn't have any walls at that time because a lot of speedways didn't and he was out in the old pine trees <laughs> rolling and flipping and i he went completely out of sight and all i seen you know every split second was a spring flying in the air or a body part flying in the air i mean it seemed like it went on forever so it was fun but then when he came back and he said okay i want to build a car that is um, I want to be the, I want the best car. I want the best car you ever built. I want the lightest car. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to cut corners. I want to use your brain, you know, and just do stuff that we haven't done before. So we did. I mean, it was a car that was really light. I mean, it was, we went, <laughs> it, we went to the extremes on light on everything. And it was, it was great. And we had Lloyd McCurry at uh, pro pro po or pro power. I think. And, uh, yeah. He was he, tough, man. He, yeah. He built and some, that, he built some stuff. Well, boy. My, my, my ex partner, the guy that really, I got into racing back here with was Mark Smith. And, uh, I knew him from, he used to work for uh, years as an engine tuner at, uh, at Dennis Fisher's out there. Oh, and I was traveling oh. Up, the west, up and down the West coast. You know, I, I met Mark, uh, two completely different personalities, but we both respected each other's abilities and it, it, it was a lifelong friendship. And that's how we ended up racing together. Uh, but all that stuff, um, you, you, like I say, you get Mark and he, he, we did all these things and we were able to build newer cars and stuff. So I was always able to keep going. I mean, we never, we never really got into a rut. I mean, and when we, we kind of did get in a rut, we were building cars there for a few years that were basically the same cars. And then everybody wanted to buy cars that were different, even though we were winning all the races. So that was kind of one of those deals that baffled me a lot. So we had to come up with some changes and Garrett had the money and he wanted the new car. And we come up with some wild changes that we made same basic car, just a little bit different construction under slung rear end and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, you know, it, it's, it was always people like that. It was, it was Chuck or it was Garrett or it was Walbridge or it was Eaton, you know, you name them. I've got, there's guys in California that we did a lot of stuff. I mean, uh, I got to meet when I was doing Walbridge stuff, the guy that was running his deal was Ron Drake and he was from Reading and uh, pretty established. I knew him from racing at Shasta, uh, knew him for years. He did that stuff with Walbridge and him and I got to be friends and he ran my store in Bakersfield when we 
when we, when we were, had that deal going out there, building cars down there, Ron was actually building them and selling them to the guys in California. Um, that's, you know, that's kind of how we met him. And he's my neighbor. I mean, he lives across, uh, he, he lives in a house behind me up three. God, so, that's crazy, I, man. He's been back here. And, I, you know, and I think a lot of those guys that came back here, I think came back because I came back and they could make it. I actually got Ron back here because uh, I had our cup team and hired him. So he moved back here, moved his family back here, and he's been back here 20 some years, you know. Um, but it, there's just been so many good people. I mean, I, I've always felt in hiring good people. I mean, the current uh, competition director in NASCAR is Scott Miller. And his first job in NASCAR was working on my cup team. So I had some excellent people work for me out there and here. I mean, I've been surrounded with excellent people, and that's really the secret of my my success, if you want to call it, you know? Yeah, man, absolutely, dude. You know, your stories are – you're great. man, they're, they're awesome. Now, 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 Mr. Crothers told me – he sent me a message today, and he told me to ask you about when you were going down, working for Eaton – I think you were picking up some cars from Ivan Baldwin. Oh my gosh! And he said you ended up you ended up not leaving for a few days. <laughs> well, I actually <laughs> I actually did leave, but it took me a few days to get home because Ivan was well known for partying along with racing, like most everybody was back in those times. So we went there, and I think Chuck was there at the time. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was anyway. And <laughs> we, we finished, we finished the car up and then every night for about three days or so that I was down there getting the car finished. Um, we went out and drinking all night. Oh, I mean, baby. Like, I mean, it was the big drunk back like the old days drunk. Yep. Yep. And, uh, by the time I left there, uh, I had Ron's motor home and the trailer <laughs> and, uh, put it in a trailer and I was so hungover and sick, I, just, I didn't get too far down the road, and I pulled over in a rest area, I think, and slept for <laughs> quite a while. And it took me a few days to get back. But I couldn't hang with them, guys. I tried. You yeah. know, but I couldn't hang with them. Was, was Garrett a partier? Um, Garrett does everything kind of the same way, kind of sly. You know? <laughs> um, everything about Garrett is, is kind of like, oh, shucks. Yep. I think – some of the biggest part of his success is the fact that anybody will tell him anything because he's such a down home, down to earth, oh shucks kind of guy. I've seen people open up to him, all, all the greats. I mean, just about everybody. He's not afraid to call anybody. You know, he'd call Dick Trickle. He'd call, he'd call Al Kowicki. He'd call, you know, he called them all. He talked to them all and they'd tell him everything, you know, like he was harmless. And then, and then he'd go out there and kick your butt. You know? <laughs> That's kind of the way that he parties. He kind of gets that sly. Anybody that knows Garrett, he kind of gets that sly little grin, you know? Yeah. That's, that's pretty wild out of Garrett then when he gets that grin. But knowing him as, as quiet as he is, and I mean, he's on Facebook all the time. You know, Jimi Hendrix is his favorite. So that kind of tells you about yeah, what, yeah. A, what a hardcore rocker he is. Yeah, he's man. Kind of, he just got that real soft, you know, exterior. Dude, it was so cool because – um, he was, he, I mean, he's been my hero for forever. And I, I remember when we were at Portland one year and I, you know, everybody else, this is when those Monte Carlo bodies first came out. Right. And everybody had one. And I was one of those guys where I was like, I, I don't want, I don't want to have what everybody else has. I, I just didn't, I didn't like it. Everybody had those money. I said, so I'm going to go with an Oldsmobile. Right. So I show up at Portland on the tour, and what does Garrett have? Garrett has an old body. I mean, I, I mean, I didn't even know. It was so cool. But I went down, and, and him and Soshi were down there, and I said, "Hey, man, have you ever, um, have you ever ran on the dirt?" And he said, "No, never. I've, I've never been on the dirt." I said, well, "You want to come drive my car?" And he said, "Sure, yeah, man. He, that that'd be cool." So he goes over to Soshi. You know how he does. And he says, "Hey, Jim." You know, he wants me to come drive in the dirt. You know, Garrett. And, oh, yeah. and so I said, hey, man, it's there. Well, here, here's what I know. Here's what I know, Fuge, is he thought it was – I'm sure he probably thought it was like a street stock, right? I mean, it, it, I, I just I just have this feeling he did. Yeah. But, boy, we – I mean, I had a You're pretty – You're a dirt jerk to him. Yeah, I, I had a pretty good car. You know, JJ helped me build it. Dave Goulet helped me build I mean, it was – we had some wrecking yard pieces on it, but it was, I mean, uh, if you looked at it, it was a, it was a, it was a damn nice car. 
And so when Garrett got there, I mean, dude, he was like, he was like silent for like 20 minutes. He sent me the pattern because I loved his number. So he sent me the pattern. I had all that on there. And he walks around the car. I mean, he must have paced his car about 10 times. And he gets on the phone and he calls John Vickery and he says, uh, man, dude, you should, you should, you should see this, man. They got the panor bar mounted to the left. And I mean, he was going, he was going crazy. And so you got to know for a guy like me, um, to have your hero there getting ready to roll your ride. I told him, I said, my motor's not going to be nothing like what you're used to, but, um, he went out there and this is no kidding, Fuge. He went four tenths quicker than I ever went in the car and it kind of pissed me off (laughs) (laughs) yeah but man he could he he was awesome i mean he he was just um so i gave evans his first dirt ride and uh it it was i mean dude it was so it it was so cool i see by the pictures of your studio there that uh, he's kind of high up on your list since he's top center there yes sir you know it and you know i got the letter i don't know if you were there when he went to hickory but he brought one down there, um, and he called me up, and he said, hey, man, you know, because I was kind of messing around doing some hand lettering stuff, and so uh, his guy kind of was backed out. He says, you want to do one? I said, yeah. So I went over, man, it took me forever because I wanted it just perfect, but um, it went back there, and it was it was a head turner. I mean, it was, oh, yeah. it was pretty cool. No, he's pretty well respected back here. Garrett is pretty uh, well. You, it's funny because you talk about, you know, having your hero drive your car. I had – and, and to follow into the same story, the first car that I ever had Bobby Allison drive was a, a car that I kind of helped Derek build over the telephone while I was in California working for Bill Schmidt. And he you you work you Jack- work for Schmidt too? Oh yeah. I, I had a, I, at the end of 1979, I decided I wanted to move on and, and travel around more. Ron was plenty happy to be in the Northwest, and he didn't want to he didn't want to go any farther, which is fine. But I, I decided to go work for Bill Schmidt. And uh, by the way, that was the best finishing cup race I've ever had, by the way. Yeah. Um, when I was with him. We, so we, I went down there at the end of 79 and stayed there through about, I don't know, April or May of, uh, of 80. And it just really wasn't what I wanted. So, but we did get a chance. I got, I got a chance to go to Daytona 500 with Bill Schmidt. So here you go, 1980. I'm at the Daytona 500. God. We drove all the way across the country. In his dually with his big trailer, we stopped in uh, Atlanta. Uh, I was with uh, Lloyd McClary from Pro yep, Motor. Yep. Or, I mean, uh, Pro, Pro Power. Power. Yep. And uh, we drove all the way across the country, and uh, we stopped in Atlanta. And we got a uh, our, our engine was built by John Reed from Reed Cams, so we put the engine in there, and we went off to Daytona, and that was like my, you know, I mean, I just I couldn't believe it. I went to Daytona. I was so disappointed that that racetrack looked like some old dirt track place from middle of podunk, I guess, Idaho. You know, I mean, it was not fancy by any means because we had Ontario Motor Speedway, so I knew what a, a speedway should look like. And I got to Daytona, and I could not believe it. Now, the speedway itself was was awe-inspiring, but I swore to God I'd never, ever do that again because we couldn't get the car stiff enough. The stiffer we went, the faster it went. I mean, I was so far out of my element, it was unbelievable. Uh, I think we had a pretty good, pretty decent finish, you know, a top 20, I think it was. But, I mean, we got to – you talk about history. We pitted right behind Buddy Baker. Wow. I get the Silver Ghost, the one that these – that he set all the records with, the Daytona for the fastest Daytona 500. We were pitting right behind them. So, that was that was another, another cool deal. But, anyway, so I was down there. Derek was just getting started. And I had helped him – I had helped him and knowing his dad and his uncle, I had helped him uh, – uh, kind of get started before I moved for, and at the end of 79 and he was wanting to race so we bought a car from Jackie Cooper that Portland Jack McCoy built Yep. and uh, we wanted to put I mean at that time the Chevelle clip was the way to go so I, ta- I got Derek and, and I think a little bit of help with JJ we got him a clip from the wrecking yard parts and I helped him put it on there and I think actually JJ did the majority of the work putting it on there but I helped him build that thing and how to mount it and how to do it over the phone. And as it turned out, when I when the things didn't work out for me at Bill Schmidt's and I wanted to come home, Derek's dad just conned me into coming up there and going to work for them. Well, I thought he really wanted all my intelligence for building racing engines. 
Uh, so <laughs> little did I know the real reason why Peter there. So I went up there and I started building engines professionally for them. And uh, well, I was working at I was working with Derek at night. So at the end of that uh, on that first year, we were running some Winston West stuff and some sportsman stuff. And Derek was coming up and he was doing pretty good. Well, Bobby Allison uh, ended up they they rented Derek's ride um, at Portland. Uh, so Amick, Bill Amick paid us to, to get Bobby Allison in the car and he was the coolest dude I ever seen. You know, it was just a matter of, we got down there and we were like really fast and it had a little bitty steering wheel. And he said, we need to get this steering wheel off here. You need to get me a real steering wheel. So bigger. <laughs> the only thing we could find at the time is we had a sprint car sitting in our shop, which was another story because Derek and I ran sprint cars for a while, which people don't know. And so they brought that big steering wheel in there. And it picked, he, t I guess Bobby told me he would, he would uh, pick up the speed about another half a second if we'd get him a steering wheel. So we got him a steering wheel and he only picked up like four tenths. And I said, we well, only picked up four tenths and he, it had a fiberglass seat. And he said, well, I can't turn it all the way. So if you bust this seat away with a pair of pliers where I can turn it, he said, I'll get you your other tenth. So he went out there. <laughs> sure enough, I ran everybody, but it was the same thing. The car was built in a, in a wrecking yard. And Bobby Allison walked around, looked at that car, and he just got a big old smile on his face because he knew he was working with a bunch of racers. Needless to say, he won the Winston West race there at Portland by two laps. Um, the, the NASCAR was screaming in my ear to slow him down, slowing him down. He was thinking up the show. And I told Bobby he needed to slow down. And he said, well, let me tell you something. He said, we'll talk about this after the race. But I ain't slowing down. <laughs> I love it. And I and I said and I said, well, you know, it's it's entertainment. NASCAR's telling me it's, we got to entertain the fans. It's boring. And he says, we'll talk about it after the race. So after the race, he he, he kind of comes over and says, let me tell you why I didn't slow down. He said, because there's it's their job to make this entertainment. He says, it's my job to win the race. He said, there's been plenty <laughs> of times that I've had the fastest car and I've had a problem and they never stopped the race for me to fix my problem and go back out there. He said, so that's their problem, not mine. So that, that deal was pretty cool because Bobby, he, he, he really liked that car. It was built in the wrecking yard. And then the next time he drove was when we were building the uh, late model sport on, uh, sportsman cars for Yakima and they were coil over cars, all that. And we took Chuck's car over and rented it to Bobby. Same thing. He got in that car and just dominated. Just everybody. flew. I mean, yeah. He just, and Bobby said, I need this thing to turn better and turn better. And I said, well, how do you want to do that? And he said, we, we ran cast to like two degrees on the left, four on the right. And Bobby said it was a strut rod car. And I remember Bobby saying, um, just lengthen that strut rod out in the left front and let me go out and try it. So we lengthened it out, set the toe, sent him out. That was better. He said, do it again. So we did it. We did it about three times. You know, and he said, all right, that'll be, that's good right there. I love that. And it's like one of my guys said, well, what kind of caster do you want? And he said, I don't care what caster I want. He said, whatever it does, the car does whatever it needs to do. That's what I want. <laughs> he said, I don't get hung up in numbers. He said, you need to quit worrying about numbers. So that was that was kind of the whole story, and he proceeded to lap everybody by a lap, and probably could have could have run away a little bit farther than that, but he got to play him with Rick Schultz there for a while when Rick was racing his butt off trying to get a, his lap back, and uh, I think we beat Rick by one lap there, but it was the same thing. I mean, I raced with Bobby Allison twice, and we were two and zero. Wow, so, man, dude, I I love what you said, but don't get hung up on the numbers, right? Just man, if this thing's working and I like it. We're going with well, it. He, he did the same thing at Portland when we were down there after the steering wheel thing. That He said uh, he ran it, and he said, pull a shim out of the right front or put a shim in it or whatever it was. You want more camber. So we put an eighth-inch shim in it, and he did that about three times. The fourth time, he goes, whoop, that was too much. Put it back. He said, we'll leave it. And somebody said the same thing to him. He said, well, how much camber do you want? And he goes, whatever it needs. God dang, that's awesome. So that those are the kind of lessons. I mean, you learn from people like that. I mean, you just – numbers are – People get caught up in numbers, and the, the successful people don't. They just do whatever you need, you know. Dude, but but the but the fact that he knew it was camber, you know, that's the that's the that's the mind blowing part, you know. And that's what I t that's what I tell everybody, you know. You you, you got to ask, you know. It's like always question everything, you know. Why is it the front end? Why isn't it the back end? Why did you do this to the back? And why didn't you do anything to the front? You know, I mean, it was yeah. just um, it's just crazy, you know. Dave Goulet, who I learned. Um, an awful, an awful lot from, you know, he, he, um, m by the way, I, I he was will say, good, he was a pretty good driver too, you know? Yes, he was. He was a damn good wheel. And let me tell you what, him and junior Herschel junior, they're two of the best 10 men you have ever seen in your life. 
I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I could measure a piece of tin 800 times and it would still have gaps all over it. It wouldn't fit. I'd have to trim it. Goulet would go over there and measure it. You know, he'd take five minutes to go measure it, and the sucker would be a 16th all the way around. I mean, it'd be perfect. Oh, yeah. No, he was good at that stuff. He yeah. Was good at that stuff, Super sure. good at that stuff. But, all right, so top five drivers in your cars. Can you do it? <laughs> top five drivers in my car. Oh, boy. I mean, I, I don't want you to leave anybody out, but I mean, if you had you know, to I pick, mean, I mean, I, I got to start from the beginning. I mean, Ron Eaton. I mean, uh, that guy's cerebral. I mean, yep, that's a given he, right he, there. He beat you. He beat you with his head. I mean, by far, he just blew everybody's mind away. Um, yeah. Bobby Allison obviously drove for me out there. I mean, Garrett Evans. I mean, how, how do I? I can I can give you that list before I even get three or four years into my racing career. <laughs> you know? I mean, Chuck. I mean, you know, Chuck Flora, I mean, I, I don't want to leave anybody out, but I mean, then you get back here, I had Bobby Hamilton drive for me. I've had, you know, I've had, I've just had so many people. I mean, David Pearson drove for me when I, did when he I did really? George Jefferson's, we did George Jefferson's car at Sears Point, you know, and he drove for me. I mean, I've been blessed. I'm telling you, seriously, I've been blessed. I've just had some great, great race car drivers. Um, I, I Mike, Mike Chase. I was just going to ask you, Mike Chase was a stud, man. He he drove my house car down at, at Mason Marin, and I mean, we they kicked everybody's butt down there. And I mean, it's like, I, I hate to even say it. because What about Corelli? Did he drive for you? No, I never raced with Corelli. I raced against him a lot. He was, against he, him a lot. he was pretty tough. Yeah, we have a love-hate relationship, me and Corelli. Did you? Oh, yeah, yeah. He was he was one of them competitors that never really got on board, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, we kind of always had that sly deal, and I, I work with them, and I, I've worked with and against them for years, you know. So how about how about a, how about Chuck Crothers? I mean, did you work with him a lot? I worked with Chuck a lot when he was around, you know, wrenching cars, and like I say, he was with Ivan and all that stuff. But it's it's just there's so many great people that we worked with. I mean, Chuck Crothers was a fixture on the West Coast, you know, and he ended up coming back here. I mean, Mark Reno. I mean, Mark Reno was the guy that pushed me from the California guy. That I that I compared myself to up in Washington, you know, he was the, he was the on the forefront, you know, um, and and I that's who I aimed for. The California guys, you know, we competed each against each other. The, the Southern guys and the Northwest guys, yeah, we all competed with each other. I mean, back when they had the International Drivers Challenge, dude, those were awesome, weren't they? Like hardest hardest D and all them guys, man, when oh I, man. When I tell these guys, when I tell people out here that we used to have a series that raced seven races in nine days, you know, and there was 150 cars showed up everywhere, you know, and that's where we got to. You know, I got to meet so many good race car drivers. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, I met Joe Rutman. I met. I met uh, Larry uh, Phillips, Larry Phillips. I mean, you can keep going on and on Mark Martin. I mean, we raced against them all. They were all there. I mean, um, how, how, just... how, my gosh, how tough Phillips was damn tough. Wasn't he? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely was. I mean, he was a racer through and through hardcore. And, and I mean, how about junior he, Hanley? Uh, he, he was tough. We never, I never really got to know him much. But Junior um, Junior could turn it, man. He could turn yeah, Larry it. Larry I got to know Larry Deachins pretty good before he got killed. And uh I mean there was just there was quite a few. I mean I met Rusty. Rusty was working for him, Rusty Wallace, when uh Larry came up and was running northwest. Rusty was his crew chief. I don't wow. know if a lot of people people didn't know that. Wow, yeah. no, I didn't. You know, I remember when there was an IDC race, I think it was, where I, I, I think um I think JJ actually made the dash with Joe Rutman. I think it was yeah. it was Eaton Rutman and JJ and and I, I don't know if it was Phillips. McGriff or somebody, but it was Phillips. It was Phillips, man, dude, man. For Safino to get in that bad boy, dude, I'm yeah, telling I remember, you, I remember that was good. But that that's just a typical deal of it lets you know how racers it, it, it gets you psyched up because you only run as fast as you have to. Bobby Allison taught me that because he told me one time he said I love racing other people's cars. And I said, why? He goes, because they're always better than mine. And I said, what do you mean they're better than yours? He goes, well, you only go as fast as you have to. And he said, if I'm a better driver than somebody and I can go faster than them, then when you're going fast enough to beat him, you can work on your race car. <laughs> so I, I, I never really realized that. And I remember, I don't, I think it was the 14-second barrier. It may have been the 15-second barrier at Spanaway 
when I was with Ron, I mean, for two or three years, we were trying to break that 14 second barrier and we couldn't do it. We were winning all the races, but we couldn't do it. And they had that IDC race there and Phillips and Rutman showed up. And I think we were third quick, but we were like 1380. Jeez, I mean, that's freaking two awesome. Under, two tenths under. I mean, we were hitting 14 flat every time, but we could never get into 13s. And it's a typical deal. We had to work harder to beat them guys and you go faster. Dang, that's awesome. I mean, dude, those are, man, those of you just tuning in, we're with the great Dave Fuge, man. If you're missing this thing, you guys are crazy. That's what I'm saying. Dude, these, I mean, these are, uh, back then, I mean, that's my next question on here. The difference between today and yesterday. I mean, I know it's the cars. I know it's the, you know, it's what I, it was, I, I was talking with my co-host the other day who, unfortunately can't be here but you know I, I i was telling them you know the the biggest thing that these guys are missing now is they they ship the now now i'm not trying to take business away from anybody don't get me wrong but when you know i know when i wrecked my car or whatever like that i mean i had to figure out how to i had to figure out how to fix it and and, and so when you do that there's just um you know, I, I I don't know. I, I guess it's always about the struggle at the end of the day. You know what I mean, Fuge? You, you you look back, and, yeah, you had some great memories and all that stuff, but it was about the struggle. It was on the road. It was those things when you overcame all that stuff and had to figure stuff out. And, um, God, man, I, I don't know. It's just all those late nights where you're eating beans and wearing jeans and working all night and, uh, just, rain your beer. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I just think there's, I, I just think they're missing such a big part of what motorsports is by shipping it off and saying, here, fix it and call me when it's done. Well, it's just, you know, that's, that's the one thing about the race, building race cars and all that stuff is getting to know all these guys, you know, and we, we would have Monday mornings that would be lined up. Whoever got there first, we got, we started working on our cars and it was, I, I would have never made it, and my business would have never made it would, if it wouldn't have been for two people. And that's that's Roy Gidlin and – can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. It's Roy Gidlin and my brother John. I mean, they worked their butts off. Roy was one of the most – is one of the most talented people I ever met. Um, and they – you know, they put up with me. I mean, they took over when I had to be the boss and I had to be um, – the one that went, went around talked to people and selling, they did the hard work. You know, my brother and Roy, they were there working. You know, Doug Bales worked there with us. Um, they, those guys are the ones that really made it. I mean, if I I could dream all I want, but if it wasn't for those guys being there, I, I wouldn't have been nowhere. It's if I, like I say, it's really been all about the people. But when you go back now and 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 you want to compare the old times to the new times, I mean, it starts out with just like it's times in general are changing. I mean, we all grew up without computers, all us old guys. And nobody could understand that. But, I mean, we grew up and we loved cars. That's what we did. I mean, cars was the culture. And every kid grew up, every boy grew up wanting to be involved in cars and girls too. And <laughs> they don't do that anymore. And cars are built different. I mean, it's just a different It's a different time. I mean, I think of all of our, our, our previous racers, they all felt that their time was the better. But, I mean – I still think we were kind of in the golden time. We were in the, we were at the end of the times when you were building wrecking yard cars, and we got to see all the de- developments with with uh, hand built chassis, hand built bodies, coil over springs, all the exotic shocks that we're running today, the disc brakes. I mean, those guys would laugh out there today if they'd see the drum brakes that we thought were the hot ticket that we used to get, you know, years ago. Well, I mean, it's just it's just you don't you don't you just buy it. I mean, we had to, the smart guys built it, and it used to be about. It really used to be about the car and the mechanic as much as it was about the driver. You had superstar mechanics back in the day. You don't have that anymore. It's all drivers. So they've turned it all into a driver's deal. But you can't really blame anybody. It's not going to go backwards like anything. I mean, we're not going to start adding without calculators. You know, I mean, unfortunately, it's just not. I mean, the time I raced, I raced because I could go be creative. Now they don't let you be creative. All these cars are all the same. Uh, cups go into cars that are built uh, by Delara, and everybody has to buy that chassis. I mean, it's, it's no fun anymore. I it mean, isn't. Just, they take the imagination away. You know, and I've always said it's the imagination 
that let the poor guys run with the fast guys. And 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 and, and I think that's I, I don't know. I've I've always um, said you know there's always going to be the haves and the have nots. You're never going to change that. I, I, well, I don't know how you can do that. And I mean, by- the big thing is the big thing is, is I moved to North Carolina because at that time, if you worked hard, you could you could make a dent in this deal back here. You could be part of it. And it doesn't matter how smart you are or how hard you work anymore. It doesn't matter. I mean, I for probably the last 10 years before I retired from racing, I mean, I beat myself to death and worked my guts out trying to be competitive. And just working doesn't work anymore. It's just it's all about money. And who buys the most engineers and buys the most technology, and it it is it's a it's not doesn't have anything to do with hard work anymore. So that's the biggest thing that I take away from it. It's the big problem. It's not it's not um, it's not you don't get here because of hard work, and hard work doesn't make a difference. It don't matter. You can't you couldn't come from Washington State now and go out and race the big time uh, like I did. It's just not possible. Wow. And isn't and in your eyes, isn't that sad? Well, of course it's sad for me because I grew up in that time. I mean, the problem is, is when you realize that you're you're 60 years old and you're trying to make a dent. My last job in racing before I before I retired from racing was I ran the shop at JTG uh, Motorsports with uh, AJ Allmendinger driving, and then Chris Busher next. But and it's like those guys don't understand your stories. They're all 30 something. You know, which is nothing wrong with 30 something, but they all learned a different way. So you can't even bridge that gap. They have no idea what you're talking about and they can't fathom even what you're talking about. You're talking, you might as well be talking Greek because they don't have any idea. So you can't talk to them one on one because they don't get your perspective. I mean, my perspective comes from what I learned growing up and the things that I learned from a wrecking yard and, and people's and and all that stuff, and they don't they don't look that way. They're all engineers. They're all extremely smart people, you know. But it's like it's like you know, talk about millennials and everything. They're all smart too. Everybody thinks they're dumb because they have to have computers and everything else, but they're smart in their own ways. And with the technology, they know how to do it, you know. And now, when you look at like my career when I came along, you have to be you have to understand your limitations and be be honest with yourself because I came back here. And I started working with Derek in, in, in 1987. I worked for the summer. And then I came back and forth in 88 before I decided I was either going to have to do it or stay home. I had to make a commitment whether I was moving on or not. And when I came back, we we knew at that time if we worked hard that we could be competitive. But I, went, I ran an ARCA race with Ernie Irvin and pretty much solidified him getting the Kodak deal because we killed them so bad with Ernie driving the car at Atlanta that we won that race. I never won again. That was 1989. I never won again until 1997 when we won the race at Mesa Marin uh, with Randy Tolson. I mean, you got to understand, I mean, that's, I was, I was winning races every weekend. It didn't matter. You know I mean? We were winning races everywhere. Everybody was winning. You know, all my guys at all these racetracks were winning and it was great, but you know, you get used to that stuff. And and when I came back here, I had to have an eye opening. You know, and you have to be serious. It's like, do you have what they have? And the bottom line is, is a few years after we got here, we, we there's no way we could have what we have. When we were fortunate enough to get the country time deal and get Bobby Hamilton, that was just about the time that the tide was turning. I mean, I can tell you that we had a, a, a sponsorship deal in a cup car, and we were competitive week in and week out, running in the top 20, uh, that we had like eight people in our shop. Our budget was like $1.6 million. You know, that was our sponsorship. I mean, unbelievable. We ran in, when I ran Loy Allen in a Hooters car at Daytona, and we won the pole for the Daytona 500 in 94. It, we ended up with $2.4 million was our budget for that entire year. Holy you know, crap. We won, we won three poles. But it, it was getting to the point, it was getting so expensive, it didn't matter. In 94, if we'd have had, we had a $2.4 million sponsorship, and if we had $3 million, we'd have been with, with the big boys. But it wasn't short after that that all of a sudden engineering took over, and the cars changed, and they couldn't run stuff from the wrecking yard anymore because the cars were so, so much alike, and they were too small. You know, I mean, people don't understand. The reason why NASCAR built the cars they built is because the cars that we're, that we're racing is they're too small compared to the cars. You know, Somebody go look at a 66 Chevelle and then go look at a, a Chevy Malibu right now. You know, see the difference. 
you know, those cars are not the same size. You can't use any body that from the from the manufacturer. There's not one part manufactured anymore, not one. And if it wasn't for Oldsmobile and Pontiac, we would have never got our cup team off the ground because they gave us so much stuff. It was unbelievable back at that time. I mean, they gave us transmissions. They gave us engine blocks and cranks and rods. And I mean, just we raced and built our team because of the stuff that they gave us. But that stuff's not around anymore. And now it's all engineering. So if you can't spend all your time in the wind tunnel, you're not going to go anywhere. And it's all about wind right now. I mean, I've seen all these cars, all these cars that I used to, the chassis that I used to sell for $1,900. And if they bought a complete car, I gave them the chassis for free. You know, now these chassis, same chassis, they look exactly alike. Maybe they're fancier, maybe because they're TIG welder or whatever, but it's the same chassis that we used to build that, that's coming out of Fury race cars. You know, all these guys that are really, really big, they're like eight, nine thousand dollars just for the bare chassis. You know, God. it's nothing different. It's got some CNC parts to bolt on, but the cars are really not different. You know, there, there's nothing about them that's different. And, and it's just because people will pay it. I mean, if I'd have known I could have made that much money in late models, I might have gone back to late model racing. You know, so you can't, you, you just can't compare the two. It's kind of like anybody that I hear compare Jimmy Johnson to Dale Earnhardt is an idiot. I mean, because they're two different times. They're two different kind of cars. I mean, you can't compare people from different eras. You know, it's no different than football, trying to compare people from football from a different era when people weren't as athletic, they didn't have the equipment, you know, they didn't hit as hard, they weren't as fast. You can't compare them to football players of this time. So it's a nice argument, but, I mean, get real. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. You know, I, I, I'll tell you, Fuge, I, I'll be honest with you. Even when – the you know like even when Cope was back there and he won what was that ninety one or two yep. or whatever, yep. I mean I mean um, even then man I'm here to tell you, give me a half mile five eighths three eighths short track race late model race any day, any day oh, I'm yeah. sorry oh yeah I mean it's but unfortunately it's like different I mean we used to have people. There used to be all kinds of people, but everybody wants a trophy. I, I go to the local short tracks around here. A couple of years ago, I went with uh, my wife's cousin, and we went to uh, Greenville Pickens. We went to Lanier. We went to some of these big racetracks back here. I mean, and dude, there's like eight cars, and they have like six or seven classes, you know. And I'm, I, you know, so I'm thinking this is what I'd do if I had a racetrack. And I'm talking to Garrett because obviously he's losing his bet because and he has a racetrack. And he knows there's not a whole lot of money in it. And I said, Garrett, why don't everybody just get together and run one or two classes, figure out how to make it inexpensive with a motor deal and a tire deal and all that stuff. And Garrett said, because they all want a trophy. He said, it don't matter if there's three cars in a class of a guy, a kid comes home with a third place trophy. He's got a trophy, you know? And he said, and if you just have less classes and more cars, he said, don't just quit. So it's like I never thought about it from that perspective, but Garrett has because he's been in there. So he's already thought about it. But that's – it's just – it's sad when you go to local short tracks. It costs too much money. I mean, all that stuff costs too much money. And I guarantee you right now I could go build a cheap race car and kick everybody's butt with it because the cars ain't changed much, you know? God, that's amazing. I, I, I Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it, – Yeah. Well, you know, my last question before before we let you go is, and this is kind of kind of on 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 that thing is, so kind of touching on what you just said about that. Hey, I could go build a race car right now. They haven't changed that much. Are 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 there basics? Or is there a stock car one hundred and one that you're never going to get away from? I seen you looking at a tablet right there. You're going to like try to pin me down and like you're going to take notes. <laughs> no, no, these are I just. <laughs> I just, I just had my notes written on here. Don't worry, Fuge. I got them. I got them. I got them. I got. I got them <laughs> right here. I'm listening to every single the bottom, word you're saying. The bottom line to all of it is nothing's ever changed. The basics are the same. You got to do the basics. You got to pay attention to detail. You know, and you need to figure out how to be consistent because consistency is win races. The one thing I can remember that was so different when Bobby Allison drove Chuck's car at Yakima was I watched him run the entire 200 laps, I think it was, at the Yakima 200. That makes sense, I guess it was 200 laps. That he ran like 2120s every lap. I mean, he was within a tenth of a, tenth of a second of every lap for the whole race. 
And you just don't see that. I mean, and the competition makes you better. And, you know, I, I just see that. So you just, you got to, you got to, you really need to forget. And I told you, Gary can tell you, I've said this to him a thousand times, but I said, quit thinking about magic because there ain't no magic. You know, get yourself a good race car. that's basic. Learn what you got and keep working with the same stuff and be consistent. And that'll make the difference. I mean, as far as, you know, when you start getting back here and you start realizing all the differences, geez, if I had, if I had a year or two knowledge a year before, I guess that I attained it, I'd be a world beater, but aerodynamics is like everything. And I, and I was talking to Ron and I talked, I had the same conversation with Chuck when I was out there this spring. It's like, you know, it's all aerodynamics. I said, I could kick your ass right now if we went there and, and uh, I just work on aerodynamics. We wouldn't have changed nothing. I said, I don't care what you put in a car. I could make the aerodynamics of that car if I wanted to spend the time. And of course, Ron being 78 or whatever years old he is, you know, he said, well, can you come out and help me out? <laughs> you know, it's typical, but I mean, there's just so many things. I mean, there's so many things that people think that are important and, and things that you don't realize. I mean, geometry used to be important, but cars don't move anymore. So it doesn't matter what the geometry is. As long as the caster is, is right and the camera's right for the tire you got and the racetrack you're going on, from that point on, it's like, it's just the platform and aerodynamics, you know? So it doesn't matter. I mean, all the cars that they're running today in lay models, they are the same cars that we ran back then, but they have better shocks. They have better springs. They, they coil bind, they bump stop, you know, all that stuff, you know, but the things that, the things that they're that going around your local short tracks around there that people think are important about how to use bump stops and whether you should, it's just stuff that we went through years ago whether you should be on the spring and how soft the bump stop needs to be. And, you know, on it, it's just, it don't matter if you make it stay on it, it don't matter how soft it is, you know? And I always tell everybody, it's like, if you're, if you're on bump stops and the car is bouncing a little bit, then you got too stiff of springs. You need to be sitting on the bump stop so hard that it won't move because just a little tip, if you take two basketballs and you stack them and you hold them in your hands and you drop them both at the same time, the second basketball will bounce way higher than if you had one basketball. So if you're, if, if you look at your first basketball as your tire and your second basketball as your spring or your bump stop, you know, that's what happens. So if you want to keep the car down, don't let it bounce. So it's just things like that. You know, it's just, it's wow. just the different stuff you learn. And I, I want you to know when we won the truck championship in 2002 and 2003, we were leading the technology with the soft spring stuff. We had, I, I had some connections with the guys at Renton Spring out there and we were doing stuff with springs before other guys were because I kept looking around for stuff and, and, and Andy at Renton Coil Spring and, and I were working uh, together and we were doing some stuff that maybe only one other cup team was working on at the time. And so we were doing that with our trucks. And when we got to, when we got to building the uh, 2004 Chevy truck and, and the new body style, we built the new truck's body style for 2004. Not the one that they're running now that they changed a couple of years ago, but the one from 2004, you know, up to probably 14 or so. Our shop did that body and did all the development for all of that truck series and each manufacturer put their own nose on it. But the body itself and, and the entire thing and all the templates were built at our shop. And when we went to the we went to the wind tunnel and tested all that all the time. But that season when I was sponsored by Chevrolet every Monday, every Monday from, I think it was, uh, I think it was midnight to midnight to 8 AM. We went to the wind tunnel or, or it was, it was eight to two or something. I don't know, remember something like that every week. And if you go to the wind tunnel every week, you can learn some stuff. You Absolutely. I mean? Heck yeah. And, and now you, and now when it goes back and I'm trying to compare those times when we were talking about you had to gauge yourself, you can't gauge yourself on your finishing positions because when you're racing people like in the Cup Series now that get to go to the wind tunnel every week, you're not going to beat them. You know what I mean? I don't care how much you work. You may go to the wind tunnel twice a season, but you're not going to beat those guys. You know, they're ahead of you in technology. They're always going to be ahead of you. So you got to look at your, you know, where you're doing. So I, I'm pretty happy with my career where we ended up. I would have liked to have been like some superstar kicking the world, winning all these Daytona 500s and winning a lot of races. But, you know, when you look at where we are and what we were able to do, uh, it was pretty good. It was pretty fun. I, I, I ain't got no, res no regrets. I've had people tell me that I should write a book, but 
I haven't found Hell the yeah. I could write it yet. Well, you know what? I got I got I got three things for you. Becky Hargett says, Dave, come on back. You can work on ours again. It was a blast. The old crew back together. You know who Becky is, right? Uh, I, I'm I'm gonna assume that she's related okay. to Chuck in some way, right? Yeah. I don't I don't know Becky. I don't think. Yeah, Becky is Chuck's daughter. She's a, she's a funny because Chuck had two sons, and one of them, Brian, came back here and worked for me for a while. But he's not racing much. But Becky's probably the most mechanically inclined and the more racer of the whole whole family so now now that chuck and candy have stepped back but uh no I, we we got a chance to go to the races with them at uh tonino south sound speedway sorry yep and uh, we had a great time it was fun me and chuck and and uh and a couple of other guys that had worked for years on their stuff we just kind of started slinging springs and throwing stuff at it and i don't know that we really helped her fiance mike but uh we had a blast you know dude so let me let me let okay. So I I, I got to ask you. Th- this has been one of the coolest shows I think I've ever had. But so if if I asked you back on on a on, on let's say next week or when when you got time, and, and and we did another show where where people could call in and or ask you or have their questions and ask you questions about the bump stop stuff and setups. Would you be willing to come back and do that? Sure, that'd be fun. That's, that's the only race that I get anymore. I, you know, I don't race anymore, so I get a chance to do that stuff. So I, I, I told Chuck and, and Ron both that I would love to come out there this year, this spring, if he wanted to pay for my wife and my grandson to come out and spend a couple of weeks out there. But because uh, uh, I just like to do it, it'd be fun. It'd be a challenge. You know, I, I always like to challenge. God. All right. So we're gonna. So. Are you, I mean, are you like busy all, all the time? Or, I mean, like, could you, could, you, could, you, you could you come back? Could you come back next Monday? Do you understand that we're all under a, a stay at home order right now? No, but I mean, would you come back on the show? Yeah. Yeah. And so I could have people. So ne- like next Monday we could have you on and say, okay, if you've got questions about your bump stop setup or you've got questions about your late model stuff, bring them and you'll answer them. Well, I'll give it a shot, but I mean, it, you know, it's not, it's not quite that simple. It is a little more technical than that. But I know, but, but one, I mean, the one thing, the one thing you got to tell everybody though is I, I have met a lot of people in my time, and I may not remember them, so that they need not be offended. Okay, I'm sure that that's cool. So, so you'll come back. <laughs> you'll come back next Monday, right? Sure. I mean, not not literally <laughs> out here, but we'll call on the that. phone, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put out that next week, if they've got questions on setup. They can, they can, they can get on here. They can ask the questions, and we'll, 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 we'll try to get them answered. Well, I'm really, I'll probably bore them to death. With no, the you won't. If you knock looking, it off, they'll be looking for some magic, and I, you know. Well, really you're going to teach magic. them the magic. That's that's, that's yeah. what I mean. The magic's not in the magic, and that's what you're going to teach them. That's what I'm going to teach them. Yeah, hard work. That's why I won all. That's why we won races. That's why Ron Eaton won a lot of races. That's why Garrett Evans wins a lot of races. That's why Chuck Floor won a lot of races. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. Because it's 11:15 your time. That's a little bit late for an old guy that's like right. you. I'm I, I, wine, I, so I I know. I'm drinking wine, so I'm all wound up. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna start my late model Monday at six o'clock next week. So that'll be that'll put you at nine your time. Okay. okay. And and then I will. T- I'm going to start. I'll, I'll I'll put it out tomorrow that if they have questions on their late model setup or you know whatever, they can call or they can. I mean, not call, but they can ask the questions on Facebook. Get them ready because you're going to be back for a second round. Will that work? Well, I, you know, I, you know. There's only one problem with that. I promised Chuck and I promised Ron that I'd come out and help them. And if I go out and tell everybody, they may not have me come back out. <laughs> Well, I'll I'll leave that up to you. Well, you don't have to you don't have to get you don't have to tell them all your secrets. Yeah, that's all right. Not a problem. I'm just being funny. Trying to anyway. That's awesome, man. Well, it's eleven fifteen your time. I, I man, I greatly appreciate your time. Hey you guys, I'm telling you, you need to spread the word right now. We're gonna have Dave Fuge back next week. If you have questions, now you've just heard it. If you got questions, you need to bring them next week. Dave Thank you very much. I, I can't wait for next week, man. I'm, I'm already stoked. I'm going to put my video out tomorrow. So I'll see you next Monday at, at uh, 9 your time, 6 my time. All right, buddy. I had fun.
Thank you, Dave. Talk to you soon, Thanks. man. Okay, bye bye. Dave Fuge, everybody. The dude is like, yeah. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, he is amazing. That's one of the best shows I think I've ever had. I I was spellbound. I hope you were too. I'm telling you, people, um, just listen to the man. He has forgotten more than most of us will probably ever know. And uh, you just can't, you can't buy what he's got. You can't. You can try, but you just can't buy what Dave Fuge has. What what a great man! I you know I I didn't know Dave. Man, he he was he he might as well have been one of my heroes too. Because I mean, car builder. I mean, seeing him all over Chuck Lorre's cars and everybody. But I mean, um, for him to be on my show. Um, to take the time. I mean, this has been an hour of his time at 10 at night. Um, God darn it, man. I'm just, I'm just flipping. God's blessing me all over the place. So I just want to say, Becky, thanks for tuning in. Jeff Clements, thank you for all the great support. Hey, right on, Brian. Thank you, man. It was the best show, Mike Easley. I'm telling you. And, and thank you, George Dodsworth. I'm telling you, bring... You need to tell all these late model guys, these guys learning, you know, Jason Berg, BJ Tidrick, um, you know, Huffines, you boys better be here next week because there's going to be, there's going to be some info flowing here. I mean, if ever you want some real deals and you can, you, and don't tell me he's been out of it for a while. I don't care what he's going to teach you in this next hour next week. Um, you better bring a notepad. You better have a pencil or a pen or something or recording. Vi- I mean, something. Um, this just doesn't happen all the time, you guys. This guy's willing to share his information, and he has got um, to, I, I, I mean, I'm not even racing, and I'm fired up. So I thank you. We went over. I, I, I know we went over, but I thought it was worth it. I hope you did, too. Next week, Late Model Monday, Dave Fuge back for round two. He's going to be talking setups, so have your questions ready. I love you, and remember, love God first, love yourself, and then everything else falls into line. Have a good, have a good rest of the week. We'll see it. We'll see. I'll see you on Wednesday. Yes, I'll see you on Wednesday. Going to be a great show on there, too. Um, going to be awesome. Oh, no, actually, I won't see you on Wednesday. I'll see you on the 15th. I'm off this Wednesday because I'm going the first and third Wednesday of every month for Northwest Race Report. So I'll see you on the 15th, but I'll see you next Sunday for our part three of our karting history with uh, Jason Gibb and then Monday night with Dave Fuge. He'll be answering all your late model short track setup or questions and answers. So please be here. Spread the word. If you like this, please share it. I love you. God bless. Peace. Well, that's that's a wrap. wrap. We hope hope you enjoyed enjoyed the show. show. If If so, so, please please like like and share share on on Facebook. Facebook. And don't don't forget forget to stop stop by terrybridgesracing.com on the World World Wide Web. Web. And subscribe so you never never miss a show. show. The audio audio version of tonight's show is now available on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, CastBox, or Podcast Addict. For the loader, Jeff Eden, I'm your horsepower performance host, Terry Bridges. And we'll see you next week for another episode of Late Model Monday. Circle Left Production.